for me, the broken road is all that's left. But I'll always remember. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Today we are going to be talking about one of my most anticipated games. I can't even control my hype for this game. We are going to be breaking down and tearing it up. The one hour gameplay for Days Gone by Ben Studio. And it's a lot, y'all. Oh, I find so many things. There's so much that I found in this. I tore it apart. I took it apart frame by frame, guys. There's so much to talk about, so let's get to it. Here is the breakdown and analysis of the one hour Days Gone gameplay by Ben Studios and Game Informer. Okay, so the first thing we see is Deacon and Boozer. We find out his name is Boozer. And as they're riding off, we see a shot of a stuffed animal dog toy, fire truck toy, and a torn evacuation alert. The first thing I notice is the loading screen is the mongrel icon for the motorcycle club. So that's gonna be our loading icon for the game. Now in this shot, you can see a little bit of the gas tank. Now, Deacon says later on that this was given to him by his dead wife, Sarah, and it's custom, and it looks like it's the mongrel logo for the motorcycle club, and it's beautiful. It's got roses, it's got the number 13 on it, but she made this custom gas tank for him. The lighting in this game, I'm just gonna show you one or two shots of it because there's too many to show. The lighting is stunning in this game. It's like the light through the trees, it's so dynamic and gorgeous. And I can only imagine how the rest of the game is going to look when it's finished with all the different lighting elements, daytime, nighttime, and it's beautiful. Now the first survival hint pops up and it teaches us how to ride the bike. Boozer calls Deacon City Boy. So Boozer is native to this area. He is a local, uh, but Deacon is not. He is probably from the city and he probably has just gone off the grid and that's where he wound up when the infection, this global pandemic happened. And so he calls him city boy and he's trying to teach him his tricks, his tracking tricks. So we have Leon who killed the woman at the beginning of the trailer and Deacon and Boozer need the information. They need the drugs from him and they're trying to figure out where they were at. He's already injured and we find out that the freakers can smell blood from a very far distance away. So he's bleeding and you can hear the blood dripping even when he's when he's like leaning over, which is the sound design in this is also incredible. We're gonna to get to that too. Let's stay on track, Deirdre. <laughs> I'm gonna try and stay on track right now. And here we are introduced for the first time of choice-based gameplay. We have a choice here, whether to save Leon and kill him, give him a merciful death, or leave him for the freakers to tear him up. These decisions will affect our story and our decisions and the people that surround us. So Deacon leaves Leon, and even though he leaves Leon, Boozer puts him out of his misery. Now, Boozer is not happy about that, so that's the decision. Even though the outcome would have been the same if you killed him or... Boozer shoots him. The outcome is different of the way that Boozer feels about you after this. You're not doing the humane thing and that upsets him as your friend. There are also optional jobs and missions in this game. We also pick up our first collectible, Leon's map. And here we have our first objective to find crafting items, materials, and a new survival tip to pick up these items. It is imperative to your survival in this game to search as much as possible to go through the environment and scavenge as much as you can. It will save your life. Now we see the survival wheel where we can make these recipes for our health. Where we can see these recipes, we can craft items. These recipes for our health will grow into stronger rebuffs down the line throughout gameplay. As the game progresses, you will have a chance to get better health upgrades. Now here they talk about camp credits. Now, because there is obviously no use for real currency in the world, for cash money all, they are going off camp credits, which you can barter or trade with. They need to stock up on supplies first. Now you can see how the bike responds to the elements when they're on the dirt roads. The wheels kick up mud when they're on the dirt roads. The wheels spray up water when it's raining on the back tires. Also, the audio is so incredible. When they're driving over the mud, you can hear the mud squishing under the tires. When they drive over the boards, like a little mini bridge, instead of the dirt, you can hear the, the thumps as they go over each individual board. You can hear it so clearly. I highly recommend listening to this with your headphones on. So we come across the roadblock, which foreshadows what could happen later on in the game with ambushes, with enemies. They use this as a roadblock. You have to get out of your vehicle or off your bike and you have to put down your gun, push the cars out of the way, and that's when they attack. So we pass the Nero building as 
bef right before we get into the tunnel. It's like FEMA. It's like, you know, this version of FEMA in the game. They're an emergency medical government agency. We get our new story mission title and icon and another survival tip on how to turn the flashlight on. Now, very important that while we're going through this tunnel, we scavenge the cars for supplies, especially emergency vehicles, police cars, ambulances. They are a treasure trove of supplies. Now, this is where we're introduced with the Molotovs and we use these Molotovs to burn up the freaker nests to draw them out and then we take them out. This is where the freakers hibernate and there is more to the nest than that, but we're not gonna find out about that till later on during gameplay. We know we're coming up on these freaker nests because Boozer is about to hurl from the smell. The smell is so powerful and pungent and they are gagging the whole way through this tunnel. Okay, survival hint, we can tap triangle to switch our weapons from our main to our sidearm. Now, when we shoot these freakers, we have the mongrel icon and its XP rises, it fills up the icon with XP as you shoot and kill enemies, freakers and humans. Okay, also, since this is only two years after the apocalypse, the end of the world, the items in the world are still able to function. The car batteries are still working. Car alarms can be set off and that's what happens. The a car alarm gets set off. You can see the sound icon. This alerts the other freakers. They come out, you have to you have to stop them. Anytime there is a device where there could be a sound going off, you should try and dismantle it, dis take it out before they come, because once you set that off, the freakers are coming for you. Once you kill these freakers, you can collect their ears for a freaker ear credit, which I thought was insane. It kind of reminded me of The Walking Dead when Daryl has the necklace of the walker's ears on his necklace. So they collect these as proof that they've killed these freakers and that you can trade them in for, you know, whatever you need. Like you can barter them and just to prove that you are for the cause and you've been taking out these freakers, you can use them as currency, as a credit. And what I like about it is that it looks like you don't have to do anything to pick them up. You just like walk over them and they automatically go into your inventory, which is nice because you can wind up collecting a lot of them and you don't have to waste a lot of time clicking buttons. You just walk right over them. Now it's this point in the walkthrough that Boozer starts talking about Sarah and Deke, it's not your fault. Um, if you would have got on that chopper, things might not have been different. You know, so he's like, he doesn't want to talk about it. He's like, no, I'm not talking about this right now. We are not going there. Let's get the fuck out of this tunnel. So this is where John Garvin and Jeff Ross start talking a little bit about the infection. If Deke gets bit, he can die. So this would lend credence to the fact that this is an infection. If you get infected, you will turn, but if you get bit by the infected, you will die. So there seems to be like an ecosystem for these freakers and how it's infected, how it translates to the world and to the humans and what transpires afterwards. Okay, so there is not a bottomless inventory. It's limited, but you can upgrade it as the game progresses. It's not bottomless. It's not limitless. Okay, you can create distractions by throwing a rock. You don't want to throw your bottles as a distraction because you need those bottles to craft uh, Molotov cocktails. So they are more worthwhile to you as an item to craft a Molotov than it is to do a distraction. Because I think you could pick up rocks to distract the freakers or make any kind of noise. You can group enemies together and then throw a Molotov. Deacon's basic weapon that he has on him at all times, even if he doesn't have a gun or anything else, or a melee weapon, he always will have his boot knife. Now, I don't know if that can be upgraded. It really wasn't spoken about in this video, but I'm hoping that you can. But either way, no matter what, you still have a weapon on you that you can use. Okay, there is fast travel, but you have to earn it. You have to clear out these freaker nests with fire and burn them down. You have to earn it by burning down nesting zones. Then you can have access to the fast travel. Okay, so now we come across newts. Now, newts were adolescents when they were infected, and they also eat each other. This was something that we didn't know, that I didn't know about it anyway, so... They are wild, they are frightening. Nearby newts can sense when your health is low, when you're in danger, and they will come and attack you if they think they have a chance, or if you come up on them and try to attack them. If you are not bothering them and you are not injured, they will climb up high, they have to be, they need to be up high on roofs, that's where they like to congregate, but if your health is low, they will become very aggressive. They'll retreat onto the roofs and they won't attack unless you come after them. Now there are plenty of different melee weapons in this game. One is a baseball bat, one is a fence post, there are crowbars. It also tells you the life percentage of these melee weapons. It looks, depending on what type of weapon it is, like the crowbar looks like one hit will take off 10% 
of the weapon's life, roughly 10% for each hit. Swarmers are adult male and females. This is another type of freaker. Okay, now this game is wide linear. They wanted to create an ecosystem that was dynamic and alive and ever changing. The game rewards you for being methodical and smart. So it pays to take your time to go in stealthily, try and really think about what you're doing before you do it. Don't go in guns blazing to everything. You will regret it. Now about 99% of all the buildings you can enter in and search. That is huge. That is so much to actually code and get in the game. I don't know how they manage that. And this game only has a hard difficulty. Now that is pretty damn ballsy and I have to give it to them. It wouldn't be as challenging or as fun to play. It, it would take the whole challenge out of this game. So, Shout out to them for having the nerve to do that. And I, I'm like, I'm so excited to play it. You really have to work hard for this game. But if you're smart about it, it's going to make your life a lot easier. They talk about the high desert at this point. They're talking about how they have different types of weather patterns. They have snow, they have rain, they have sun. Now, it looks like there's a bunch of different health plants. I tried to focus in. They're so transparent, though. It's hard to tell. But they look like different types of health plants, different colors, different sizes throughout the world that you can pick up and um, collect. But they didn't talk about the health plants and they didn't mention it when they were going past them, nor did they pick them up in this playthrough. Okay, so now we have uh, Boozer talking about the Rippers. They put up their sigils. They're called Rippers because obviously they have RIP on their foreheads. They are a religious cult, which totally we get that. We got that from the first content we saw of them. They believe that this was a celestial event and they worship the Freakers. They're trying to be like them. They have ritualistic scarring. They scar themselves. They... They burn themselves. They make themselves look like the Freakers. They have no hair. They are wild like the Freakers. They're trying to burn off the tattoo off Boozer's arm. He tells them the loss will fall. And that's what's written on the tractor trailers in the background. Now we get back to the safe house, the tower. There's a weapons locker. You can access your weapons here. You can store your stuff here. It also tells you the type of weapon you have and all of its stats. The weapons are also categorized by number and color, depending on the condition of the weapons. Deacon's gun is a number one and it's junk, which means it's not the best weapon to have. And the shotgun is a three in its average condition. And the colors are green and purple. So they have different colors, different numbers to distinguish between how strong the weapon is and the type of weapon. Okay, so this tower is your safe house and your headquarters for the first part of the game. Sprinting burns stamina, so you can sprint for only a short amount of time, so you have to really pace yourself. Now we come across our first marauder camp. There's six people here. We have to take them out. Gives you another survival hint to use your binoculars, uh, or to crouch, try and go in stealthy, remain unseen and going in stealth is very helpful here. So the XP meter here will also fill up when you kill humans as well. It's not just freakers, it's any enemies that you have will fill up the XP. We find another melee weapon. This one's a wood bat. I wonder how many melee weapons in the world there are. I think I counted like three or four. You can loot the dead bodies. Thank God. You can loot the dead bodies for supplies, for scraps and materials. The game also tells us that weather can affect the way that our enemies can hear us and see us. So you can definitely use the weather for your advantage. We find a new gun here, the Ruger. Now we've gone through the night cycle. The Freakers are going to be more numerous. They're going to be more dangerous. They're going to be faster and stronger here. So nighttime is not a good time to be caught out. We roll up to Copeland's camp mad as hell because they have stolen Deacon's bike. He hid it under some, some branches and they found it and they took it and he is not having it. In this cutscene, when he's talking to the mechanic, uh, which is the same dude which from we saw from last year's E3 gameplay trailer who he tries to save from the bandit camp, the marauder camp. But as he's talking to him, you can hear the rain, not only the rain falling, you hear the rain hitting the tarps that are on the side where the other stands are, where the other uh, people who live in the camp have their stands set up, their booths set up. So you can hear the rain hitting the tarps. It's perfection. The sound design is incredible in this game and they're not even finished with it yet. Now you see Deacon following Copeland up these stairs all the way up to the top. You can see how large this camp actually is. It's got, it is huge. So they mentioned that the Freakers eat all the deer. So I wonder what other wildlife is around. You do see deer in the gameplay, but I guess that the Freakers, you know, it's very hard to catch them. The Freakers probably gets them all first. They're able to fish, but even Copeland says that's not going to last forever. Now in this close-up of Copeland, we can see he has this huge scar across his face. I immediately, when I saw it, thought it was like Freaker Bear scar. He was attacked by a Freaker Bear. That's what I'm assuming because freak the Freakers don't have like a long 
tell any nails. Not that I can tell anyway from any of the gameplay. So now we have a new job unlocked, let freedom ring. Now these encampments are very important. Deacon can go to these encampments. They're fortified locations. Deacon can acquire new jobs and trade with merchants. He can get new equipment. And that is my, my breakdown of this video. I'm gonna give you my closing overall points here are some things that stood out to me. The game mechanics, the choice-based gameplay, the rippers, we have the rippers, we have the newts, we have the swarmers, we have all of the freakers. The weapons that we have seem to be vast. We have guns, we have a, our crossbow, we have our knife, we have melee weapons. The gameplay seems really smooth. It seems very fluid. You can switch back and forth between weapons, how you can craft, the combat. I know there was one like one glitchy part, but I mean, this is, come on guys, it still have about nine months for it to come out. But the gameplay for the most part looks beautiful and smooth. The combat looks satisfying. I like the way we can pick up stuff in the environment for our health and the plants and we can craft and upgrade our health. I like how we can use stealth. I'll probably be using a lot of stealth when I'm playing through this game. There's multiple paths you can take throughout any type of situation. For the most part, you can go in from different angles, different ways. There's not one set way to do things and it gives you a lot of freedom to play it out the way you want to. You can search for supplies everywhere. This world looks like it's full of stuff for you to collect as much as you can. So if you're like down on supplies, you won't have to go crazy. Like you won't be so strapped for crafting items or supplies, it looks like the whole world is full of crafting supplies to help you have a successful gameplay. So the look of the faces of Deacon and Boozer when they come across the, the Freaker Nest, it looks pretty bad. The smell has got to be horrific. If you get bit, you die. That's all my main closing points. I just wanted to point out a few of them. There are more, but this was my breakdown of this Days Gone gameplay. I'm so obsessed with this. I am so blown away by what they have created here. It's going to be such an incredible experience to play. I can't wait to play it. I love the fact that they put in like a choice-based gameplay that actually affects the outcome of the game. Not for you per se, but how it affects the others around you and actually has a consequence, which I love. I like that it's on hard difficulty. I like that there's so much in the world that you can use to your advantage. You, you can use your own skills to survive. You could go in stealthy, you could go in guns blazing. It looks like a, like one of the most comprehensive gaming experiences that we've had in a long time. Doesn't take anything away from any other game. Every game is different, like God of War is a fucking masterpiece. The Last of Us is a masterpiece, like, but every game is different and this game, I don't, I don't know why people, I mean like for me, I don't have, like zombie fatigue, like they were talking about it in the interviews with the uh, Game Informer. I don't have that. I love this genre and they're doing it differently. Uh, everyone puts their own spin on it and it definitely is going to be an epic experience. I know Game Informer put out another 40 minute uh, thing. I won't be really, I won't be breaking that down. I'll be following it and I might do more videos on it, but for now, uh, as of today, um, this is what I have and I was happy I was, can get this out for you guys today because I it took a long time to work on this, so I really wanted to make sure it was comprehensive before I put it out. So that's the end of this video. If you can, please consider supporting me on Patreon. I love making these videos. It's one of my favorite types of videos to make, especially for this game because it's so rich and so dense. There's so much to talk about. Uh, it's so intriguing and it's so provocative. Like it's just, it's so intriguing to me. I can't stop talking about it. So if you can, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Every little bit helps. If you can't support me on Patreon, please leave this video a like, leave me a comment. I love talking about my theories and your theories for this game. And I'm so excited for it. Also share these videos if you can. And that's it for today. Thanks so much for watching and I'll be back with more.